Dealer meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council for February 14, 2011. I'd like to wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day. Uh, would the clerk please take the roll call? Chair Sherman? Here. Councilor Gubinelli? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Lennon? Here. Councilor Sullivan? Here. Councilor Swift Kayada? Here. Councilor Walsh? Here. Uh, please rise and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Town Council reports and correspondence. Oh, Sarah. Um, I have my monthly finance report. I have sort of three unrelated uh, topics, which I'll cover each very briefly. Uh, the first is has to do with uh, the roads and clearing them and sanding them and so forth. And I just thought people might be interested. Are we over budget? Are we doing well? Or what? I've had actually questions from citizens. Uh, and the short answer is we're doing fine. Um, in a nutshell, percentage of the budget left is 46.4%. Um, and that puts together overtime pay, gas and diesel fuel, salt and sand. So barring lots of really bad storms, which we can't bar, it's possible, but hopefully we'll get through March uh, well within budget. So that's number one. Number two, I thought um, the public might be interested in hearing a tiny bit about state revenue sharing and uh, looking at over the past 10 years, essentially how much it's dropped that is how much the state helps us in the municipal and school budgets. So just a few facts quickly. Um, at the present time, the school, municipal, and county budget amounts to $30.5 million. Um, the amount of that that's supported by our state government is $2.6 million, or 8.5% of the overall budget. In comparison to that, in the fiscal year 2000, the total budget was just over $20 million, and the state provided $3.5 million, or 17% of the budget i.e. twice what they help us with now. Uh, since 2000, total spending has increased by 3.5% on average per year. And the amount that we've received from the state has decreased uh, by 26%. The portion of the budget supported by the state has dropped from 17.4% to 8.5%. And uh, interestingly, if the state had maintained the same level of property tax relief to our schools and our municipal government, we would this year be receiving 5.3 million from Augusta. Instead, we're slated to receive 2.6 million. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to just briefly, I guess, sort of discuss with all of you the uh, upcoming schedule of meetings, many of them financial, finance committee meetings. Um, and basically, to draw your attention to <clears throat> April 25th, where we are slated to have both the public hearing on the budget and the council vote. And I know that that runs counter to what we had decided we would do uh, in our communication strategy, which was to hear from the public a month before and vote the next month. Unfortunately, um, the schedule is very compressed in an effort to have the citizen vote occur on May 10th rather than on June, in June 10th, which makes it very late if we need a revote in the summer and it sets the school up uh, to be potentially in trouble if it runs through to mid or late summer. So I just wanted to get people's feedback on that. And do you want to float your idea by, Mike? Yeah, uh, thanks, Sarah. Sarah wrote to me earlier today, actually Friday, about this. I responded early today. Uh, the, what, what the issue is is there's a sense that they ought not to hear the hearing and then have the hearing and immediately vote. Uh, what, what I'd like to offer as an option is we have a, we, you're reviewing the budget uh, at meetings on uh, March 16th, 21, April 4th, and 6th. You have a town council meeting on the 11th. The public hearing would be on the, the 25th and the citizen vote on the school budget the 10th of May. Uh, there's a real opportunity on April 11th before you've completed your budget review at that town council meeting to specifically have on the agenda the uh, opportunity to have public comment on the status of the budget at that point. It really gives folks a, a much better opportunity 
to uh, comment before the decisions are made and in plenty of time so that we still meet the May 10th deadline and we, we meet the requirements that we, that we have to meet in terms of getting the public hearing notices in, uh, uh, in the newspaper at least seven days before the public hearing. The other issue we looked at is the trying to leave some time between the final vote and the, the council vote in order to allow people to have the opportunity to vote absentee. Uh, in the past, it was really only a one-week period, which is pretty short. And under, this, under the schedule as it's now presented, it's a two-week period. It's from uh, Tuesday, April 26th to May 10th. So, uh, you know, that, that is an option for the town council to consider. Any thoughts, Frank? Uh, I think that's a, a great suggestion. Um, the question is, how much time will we, will we be able to allocate to the public hearing if we do that? And then, I, as long as you want. Uh, it's, you know, the, the trend with agenda items right now is, is briefer meetings, uh, you know, absent some major new controversy. And, uh, you know, I, my sense is we'll continue with that trend uh, right through the first half of the year. Idea. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? It seems to make some sense to me to do mm -hmm. it that way. It certainly does. A good pickup in terms so, of our consistency and uh, our communication strategy. I think if we can, we should make the agenda item near the beginning. Right. I agree. Agenda. I agree. Okay, so can we just uh, revise the schedule and put that on the uh, town website? We'll do that. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other? Uh, Town Council reports for correspondence. Okay, uh, we are now coming to the first opportunity for citizens to discuss items that are not on the agenda tonight. Does anybody wish to offer any thoughts on items not on the agenda? Okay, uh, the town manager's report. Yes, uh, just very briefly, I'd like to acknowledge the, the great work that Public Works has been doing. Uh, a lot of hours, a lot of, a lot of. Uh, uh, being out there all night long, uh, weekends and otherwise. Uh, so, you know, the, the long-range forecast is now for better weather. So we're really hoping not only for financial savings reasons, but also for the, the, uh, the good health of uh, the Public Works staff, as well as the good nature of all citizens of the community, uh, that uh, the snow uh, lets up for a brief period of time. Uh, that's the, probably the, the most significant thing to speak of. Uh, also, I, I would like to, to mention that uh, Deborah Lane has been working uh, with our computer service provider uh, at accepting online uh, payment of tax bills. Uh, citizens will be responsible for the fees on that, which are not insubstantial. Uh, uh, if they use a credit card, it's about 3%, so it's not a small amount. Uh, but that, uh, Deborah is holding her breath and uh, putting quite a few hours into the training on it and should be available at the beginning of next week. Uh, tax bills are due to go out uh, on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And I just want to echo Mike's comments on the Public Works Department. It just is amazing to wake up every morning after these storms and be able to get into work or wherever you're going without any trouble. So I want to thank Bob Malley and his crew for the terrific work they do. I should mention one other thing. The Council does have a workshop on Thursday night at 7 o'clock here in the chamber with the City Council of South Portland and the Town Council of Scarborough to discuss an opportunity for uh, purchasing in a cooperative type arrangement uh, electricity uh, for resale to res residential customers and commercial customers, small commercial customers uh, of the, the power company. So uh, not a whole lot of information available prior to the meeting. Uh, but it is Thursday night at 7 uh, here in this room. Mike, how will that meeting be conducted? Is it a presentation? Is it interactive? Uh, there will be a presentation primarily made by Eric Carson, who is the deputy manager, city manager of South Portland and their economic development director. She's been working uh, quite aggressively on that. There will also be opportunities for all of you to ask questions. Thank you. Uh, you know, we, we do have some data which is very preliminary. It, you know, it, it shows that it, you know it's tight. It's it's not something that's going to save a fortune, yet it, it it is something that you might want to consider. But it's it's in no way a slam dunk that it ought to be done. And, 
Uh, you know, as I've indicated in the past, I really look forward to some feedback on it. Okay, uh, the next item is the review of the minutes from our January 10, 2011 meeting. Is there a motion? I move to accept the minutes of the January 10, 2011 meeting. Seconded. The motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion or suggested amendments? All those in favor of the motion? The motion carries. Uh, first item, number 44-2011, the Ocean House Pizza Malt and Venice License Renewal. Uh, do I have a motion? Sarah. I move we uh, accept the request to renew the Ocean House Pizza Malt and Venice License. I second the motion. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? And the motion carries unanimously. Uh, item 45-2011, authorized, excuse me, authorization to apply for grant. Uh, Mike, could you provide us with some background on this? Yeah, very briefly. A couple of years ago, the Cumberland County government uh, took advantage of the opportunity to be a receiver of community development block grants. Uh, for a long time, a, a town like Cape Elizabeth could never apply for a community development block grant. We, we could apply, but we'd never get one. Uh, by the fact that the county now receives the funds and has a competitive process, uh, we're able particularly to work with other communities to see if we can uh, utilize an opportunity. Uh, Lois Galgay Rickett, who's with Family Crisis Shelter, Family Crisis Services, uh, has been working with, with Chief Williams uh, and with the towns of Gorham, Naples, Scarborough, and Standish uh, to have a, uh, a uh, victim advocate, I think is, I don't know if that's the correct term currently, uh, to work with our police department in going to the homes of those who are victims and in jointly assisting them with, uh, with the situation to help them uh, to, to deal with, with the instance or instances of domestic violence. Uh, in, a, in a number of other communities, it's worked successfully. Uh, Cape Elizabeth's contribution would be to host this person in one of the small rooms at our police station during the two days, would it be? One or two, one or two days that they would be uh, would be here in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, anyway, I've, I've spoken to the chief, uh, worked on this. I also coincidentally spoke to the, the uh, president of the Cape Elizabeth Police Association, the police union, and they also very much look forward to uh, having the service potentially available. So it's not uh, an automatic that we receive the grant, but we, we do hope to receive it and uh, provide these additional services for those who are, are victims of uh, domestic violence. Does anybody have any additional questions for the town manager? Is there a motion? Oh, Jessica. I was wondering, what's the, what would be the background um, uh, of this individual? Is this a social worker or just curious? From the family crisis, the family crisis OK. Well, most of those folks have a masters of social work. Any other questions? Uh, is there a motion? Anne? I move that we um, authorize the application from Cape Elizabeth uh, to Cumberland County for a CDBG grant as outlined in item number 45. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded. The motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item 46-2011 relates to a renaming a portion of South Street in the Spurwink Wood subdivision to Astor Lane. And I see we have uh, Chief Neil Williams here. Perhaps, uh, Chief, if you'd be willing to just give the council uh, some background. Thank you. Good evening. I think you have uh, most of the information that I have before me, but um, I'll start off by saying that uh, I believe it was Mike, uh, the manager, received an email from Craig Cooper um, from the Cottage Brook development concerning a possible safety issue that he um, had been relayed to by a resident down there. And uh, the resident at um, 12 South Street had been uh, concerned um, 
mostly because he hadn't been receiving packages for his Christmas gifts. Uh, but, uh, however, it turned into thinking that it could be a safety issue on, on that part should police, fire, rescue need to go to that particular location. What was happening is, um, if you see the diagram I think you might have in front of you, uh, that uh, most of the services were going on the private way of um, South Street and seeing that it was blocked off and not going back around um, to the other streets in order to get to the other section of South Street. Therefore, um, we, took, we were going to take a look at it, so Matt Sturgis and myself went down and looked at that section of roadway and determined that there was no way a vehicle was going to get through from the private section to the public section of <coughs> South Street. Therefore, uh, we felt that there was only one alternative, and that was to rename the street. So then it would go into the 911 directory and um, should any rescue, fire, or police be called, the uh, dispatching uh, personnel would know where to send the units to. We contacted um, a person on the private section to see if there was any chance that the private section was going to be upgraded to a public road and therefore we could keep the name. And he did not believe so. I contacted the manager to think if, uh, to see if uh, the public, uh, see if the town was going to um, upgrade the road on the private section, and he didn't think so. Um, therefore, um, we, we felt that there was no alternative but to rename the street. And uh, in doing so, in keeping uh, business, uh, we usually ask the neighbors or any developer what they would like for a name on the street and then uh, Matt Sturgis and myself look through the other names of streets see if it uh, conflicts in any way and Astor Lane did not. Does it, thank you uh, Chief Williams. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, although we don't have a, a public hearing advertised for tonight, does anybody here tonight wish to speak to this issue? Okay. Uh, do I, Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do I have a motion? Uh, Jessica. Uh, <clears throat> I make a motion that we uh, accept um, Chief Williams' recommendation to change the private section of South Street to a, to a new name, Astor Lane. Yeah, okay, the motion's been made and seconded, and, and, and you had a question. So I'm not sure. Is it the private section that's being renamed, or uh, yeah, is it the public, public section? I thought it was it the public, be public section. Oh, it's the public section. What will be the public? What will be public. Okay, so would you accept that amendment, Jessica? Yes. <laughs> okay, it's, I confess that I got a little confused as well. So, so it would be renaming the section that is to be public to Astor Lane. Uh, Jim. Good. David, maybe you could answer this because you have more experience on the planning board. Why wouldn't this have been picked up in the planning process for the subdivision, Spurwink Woods or Cottage Brook, uh, as an off-street sort of improvement or requirement? I mean, I just just a question uh, right. because it was a, if it was a safety issue today, it was one three years ago when this all went through the process, and I just wonder. So. I, it, it just didn't come onto the radar screen. I mean, uh, it's not very much of an answer, but I, I don't think yeah. until the, the actual development happened that there was any anticipation that there would be an issue. Yeah. Uh, Chief, did you want to speak to that? Yeah. <clears throat> if I remember correctly, uh, um, Council Walsh is correct. We do meet on those plans. But I think the thought was is that that was going to go through and that it would always be South Street, so why not keep it the same instead of inconveniencing the neighbors and changing their addresses? And it never did. And if I, I, I actually was on the planning board at the time when we reviewed this application, and I, I, there was not going to be this cutoff until the ordinance uh, change was passed by the public through a public vote. And uh, so it may just be that we grew accustomed to seeing South Street, and, and nobody, it didn't occur to anybody to make that change. Okay. Sure. Any further questions? 
Okay, the motion. Uh, who seconded that motion? I'll second. I it. will. <laughs> oh, but do you accept the amendment as well? The, the Jessica accepted the amendment as a seconder. Yeah, I made oh, the. It was amendment, your amendment, so, so obviously. Okay. So I accept. <laughs> all right. All those in favor of the motion? Yeah, the motion carries. Thank you. Uh, item number 47-2011, the Fort Williams Park 2011 group use requests. We have uh, about seven requests for group use of the park that are outlined in our materials. Uh, are there any questions regarding these requests? No. Anybody want background? Okay. Do we have a motion? Then? And Move to accept. Second. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> No, it's quite as quick on the draw, <laughs> like a, uh, the Jeopardy game show. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? It carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, item 48-2011, citizen participation at the Fort Williams Advisory Commission meetings. We have materials in our packet uh, tonight regarding uh, rules for public participation at meetings of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Uh, I don't know if there's somebody from the commission here. Okay. Does anybody have any questions, Anne? I had one question, and it applies to item 49 also. In the uh, third paragraph, it says, any person wishing to address the commission shall give his or her, her name and or affiliation. So does that mean someone does not have to give their name if they just give their affiliation? I would think that they would be required to give their name. And I would usually think that they should. Yeah. I, I would, so I, I would respectfully, I mean, I don't know if we can change this or if we have to send it back to them, but I mean, to me it seems they should give their name and their affiliation, if applicable, if applicable. or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, only because the way it reads now, it sort of seemed to me like they could just say, well, I'm a member of such and such a group. And I, I think it's a de minimis change, and if that's what you'd like, we'll, we'll report back to them that it was adopted with that de minimis change. So we will just delete the word or and just say, uh, shall I give his or her name and affiliation if appropriate? Oh, well, or I want if, 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 if applicable, applicable is better. Yeah. Everybody has a name, but not necessarily an affiliation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that change appear acceptable to the council? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we have a motion? All right. With so I would make that as a motion with that amended language okay. to, to accept their um, <clears throat> rules for public participation. I'll second that. One. Thank you. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you for picking that up. And. Uh, item 49-2011, uh, Citizen Participation at Recycling Committee Meetings. Uh, again, we have the materials in our packet, and it looks like we would probably we would want to make the same change that we did for the prior rules. Mm -hmm. So it would be the person wishing to speak shall give his or her name and affiliation <coughs> if applicable. Any other discussion points? Is there a motion? Oh. Uh, Sarah, perhaps. <laughs> I move we accept the uh, <clears throat> uh, recommendations set forth in item 49 for citizen participation at the recycling committee meetings. Sarah, second. 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 All right, thank you. A uh, motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? The motion carries unanimously. Um, item 50-2011, the Appointments Committee uh, recommendations for citizens to serve in vacant positions on our boards and commissions. Uh, Jessica, would you like to uh, introduce this topic? Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Sherman. <laughs> the Appointments Committee is very pleased to present to the Town Council the following recommendations. And um, as is so often the case, delightfully, uh, we found our decision making quite difficult because we had such excellent candidates. We are a very lucky community. <laughs> um, shall I read the names or uh, go ahead? Yeah, okay. For Conservation Commission, we recommend Garvin Donegan. For Planning Board, Richard Olfeen. For Zoning Board of Appeals, Christopher Straw. 
for future open space preservation committee Wayne Brooking Jr. Craig Cooper and Bo Norris and would you like to make a motion um, I make a I would make a motion that uh, the council accept the uh, appointments committee recommendations as a block Thank you. The motion is seconded. And it has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All, right, all those in favor of the motion? All right. Motion carries. And a thank you, uh, Jessica and Caitlin and Sarah, for uh, your work on the Appointments Committee. This looks like a very strong group, as, as usual. So thank you. Um, Item 51-2011, the Boat Rack Storage Program. The Conservation Commission has given us a review of the first year of the storage program uh, and is recommending a fee of $50 for boats left after the deadline to remove boats. And also, if somebody doesn't comply with the deadline, the recommendation is that that individual not be eligible to participate in the program the following year. Uh, we have a memo from the Conservation Commission I don't know if anybody's here from the. Uh, would you like to yes. speak to that, or, or should if the council has questions? Um, I have no questions, but I'm happy to speak to it. Okay. Um, well, why don't we see if anybody here has questions? And uh, Anne. I just have one question. Um, it looked like the original set of racks were for 30 boats, but then it said it was sort of informally 32, and I didn't know if we needed to also amend the the uh, rules or something to say would, yes would, for 32. Would you, would you mind coming to the podium so we can thank you? My name is Dina Cassana. I'm chair of the committee. Um, we built the racks for 30, but as we built them, we had a sliding section that could hold two smaller boats. And because we had such an overwhelming response for that, um, we had over 20 boats that we couldn't fill last year, that we thought we would open up those two smaller slots for you know, a smaller canoe to make it 32. And the reason we asked for the $50 fee is that in the past, people would leave their boats down there for years and they would rot away and they would, it was really an eyesore. And we just want it as a deterrent. I don't think anybody will leave their boats once that deterrent is up. I really don't. I think they will all go and the first, I think it's the first Sunday of December, and we'll start new. And next year we will reevaluate all this to see if we should build some more racks. We built them with our own equipment. And, and, and to follow up on Anne's question, mm -hmm. if, if you were wanting to build racks for 20 more boats, who do you have to get permission from to do that? Is that the Sprague Corporation? Yes. Yeah. So I guess the question is, do we need permission from the Sprague Corporation for those two additional slots on the racks? Is that your question? Well, that's what I was wondering. I, I mean, I saw this easement mm -hmm. said um, uh, in, not, in number seven said a maximum of 30 permits shall be issued. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to screw this up. I think this is a great idea, but I just didn't yeah. know. Jessica, did you want to say something? I don't want to. I, I, it's probably not worth it to amend the easement, but mm -hmm. I, so maybe we don't want to even think about well, it. Has there been a conversation with the Spray Corporation about the, the fact that there were 32? Well, they knew that we had this extra section. Um, they were present, um, John Green and um, Seth Sprague were present at yes, this exactly. meeting. Mm -hmm. And um, they were very pleased with the, this past year's review of, of the uh, boat racks. Mm -hmm. And they um, were very much in agreement that we could allow an increase to 32 boats. Mm -hmm. Because there's no construction change. This is just there's a little space at the end of a rack to put two small boats. They, were, they said they were fine with that. Um, at our Conservation Commission meeting, they saw no reason to um, adjust the easement whatsoever. And they were very happy with it. So Then, it's, then it seems to me we shouldn't adjust the easement, because that's a big hassle. But as long as they're fine with the 32, the informal arrangement of having 
32 mm -hmm. seems fine to me. Well, and as the property owner, they have the right to give permission. Mm -hmm. they, it appears they've done that. So, yeah. But mm -hmm. I, I, if, if it came time to significantly increase, then we would have to go back and amend the easement. Correct. OK. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Jim? Um, in the removal of a boat that is left behind, mm -hmm. is there any thought about taking possession of that boat at some point if it's left not claimed by the individual? Um, we hadn't really thought about that. We, um, I, we had a boat that stayed a little bit late this year, and Mike Duddy went in and cut the, the lock, and the lady did come and pick up the boat. We discussed about um, having it taken to the town um, uh, refuge center and just leaving it there. I, I don't think we discussed having it sold or taking possession. Just, it was actually the public works to the oh, yeah. Yeah. right. Not to the dump. Yeah. Okay, Frank. Will there be signage or anything uh, on the uh, racks to remind people that they have to get it off by? Um, no, we haven't discussed that, but that's a very good idea, and I'll recommend that to our committee. Uh, yeah, there. What's going to happen is in the new uh, agreement when a when a citizen permit or permit, it's going to be in the permit. <coughs> it will that be. That would be the clearly permit. stated in the permit that, and they will sign and agree to that when they pay their fee. But a sign, a small sign, would be a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? All right. Is there a motion? Uh, Anne. I move that um, <coughs> we thank the Conservation Commission and the Sprakes, and we accept the recommendation for a fee of $50 for boats left after the deadline to remove, and that boats left after the deadline not participate in the program the following year, as laid out more in more detail in the memo. Okay. Is there a second? A second. All right, thank you. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Jessica? I would just like to, also to add um, thanks to the Spray Corporation for agreeing to have two additional boats on their racks for their enthusiasm and support coming to the meeting um, and uh, helping us with all our decision making given this first trial year. So. Okay. Any other discussion? All right, all those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight Thank you. and for your work. Thanks, Dina. Item 52-2011, uh, this relates to uh, the quick claim deed for property that the town had foreclosed on, located at 145 Mitchell Road. All the past due taxes have now been paid, and the recommendation is that we authorize the town manager to execute a quick claim deed to deed the property back to the prior owner. Are there any questions for Mike or any other background you want to give, Mike? No, I'd like to thank Deborah for all of her work, not only working with this uh, property, but all the properties that, that we work with to uh, ensure that the taxes are paid and fees and cost as well. Frank. Can I just get a short definition of what a quick claim deed is? A quick claim deed, essentially the town deeds back whatever interest it has in the property to this individual. We make no warranties as to the adequacy of the title. So it says the, the lowest level of deed you can give to somebody. Is that fair to say? That's true. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Do we have a motion? Jessica. Uh, <clears throat> I make a motion to accept uh, the uh, Municipal quit claim deed back to the property owner. Is that the correct way to say it? I think that we authorize. Or that we authorize. We authorize the town manager to, to do this. Okay. Seconded. <laughs> motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion. Motion carries. Thank you. Item 53-2011, school boiler financing. Uh, Mike has provided the council with a memo dated February 4, 2011. It, it may be helpful, Mike, if you'd be willing to explain the background on this. I'd be happy to. For a couple of years, the schools have identified a need to replace the boiler at the high school, uh, the, the, which is the main heating unit for the high school and the pool and everything else down in that corner of the school property. Uh, the estimated cost to replace the boiler is $350,000. 
In addition, there's also a new heater needed for the pool of $29,000. Uh, I've had a couple of discussions with both the prior superintendent and the current superintendent over the last uh, six months about how this might be financed. Uh, we looked at it again a week or two ago. And the town, as the council is aware, has been fortunate that we had more overlay in the budget than we anticipated. Overlay is the amount of taxes that were generated as a result of more property valuation than we anticipated at the time the budget was adopted. Uh, that affords us the opportunity uh, to avoid a whole lot, to avoid borrowing all of this money. And what, what the specific recommendation is, is that we, uh, is that the town council authorize uh, 200,000 from the municipal undesignated fund balance, uh, which is where this overlay that I'm talking about lapses, uh, to help pay for the boiler. And that the balance of 150,000 uh, be funded through the, the school department get sort of a short-term loan from a bank, a, a five-year loan, a, a lease purchase type thing, uh, it, which would be repaid over the, the next five years. The, the real advantage of this is, is that when they, when they put the new boiler in the high school, uh, it has a payback of about $40,000 a year uh, based, on, based on current prices. Therefore, if you look at what the schools will need to be spending over the five-year period, uh, it won't have any negative impact on their budget. They, they'll be able to pay for this lease, uh, purchase this, this loan, uh, principal and interest, uh, with, with the revenues that, or with the proceeds that are, that are saved by not having to spend all the additional money on oil. Uh, in addition, because the money, we already have the money, uh, we're also not asking uh, taxpayers to come up with more money in the future uh, to help pay for this boiler. So really, it's, uh, it's an opportunity for the schools to, to get the new boiler and to, to uh, save money, save energy, uh, without any impact on taxes at all uh, to either the school or to the, or to the municipal budget. Uh, also, because of savings we had, with the, uh, the lighting project that we did, uh, we weren't, we, it wasn't necessary for us to use any of the local monies that have been appropriated to go with the stimulus monies to help put in that new lighting. Uh, the lighting came in under budget. There wasn't a specific match requirement. So we can use those monies as well to pay for the pool heater. So uh, there's, is, again, there's no, no amount needing to be appropriated for that. So the recommendation is, is that you authorize uh, the the town to make available to the school department $200,000 from the municipal undesignated fund balance uh, for replacement of the high school boiler uh, with the understanding that the Cape Elizabeth School Board will approve uh, financing for the remaining balance. Thank you, Mike. Are there any questions uh, for Mike? Uh, Frank. A small one. You said the 40,000 year of savings is based on current um, oil prices, correct? Yeah. So the likelihood is it's, that's going to ex expand as prices inevitably will rise. Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It and would seem so, but who knows? Right. So price, I'm, I'm hoping prices are high right now. <laughs> <laughs> Jim? Jim. Um, uh, question uh, about the 350. Um, has it, is this something that's already? gone out to bid, or is this a proposal from a current vendor? That, yeah, the, uh, this, this is the engineer's estimate for the work. Uh, they will be obtaining bids in the very near future. Uh, but they, they, they have a great degree of confidence that it will be very close to 350. Jessica. Yeah, I've got a couple questions. Um, I was at the school finance meeting at this time last year when this boiler issue was, was discussed. And uh, they were talking about it, um, the two boilers and whether they ought to do something, they ought to replace it. They discussed the possibility of natural gas, although that went by the wayside very quickly. They also discussed getting um, an engineering study on the boilers. And was that done? Yes, it was. By, by oil people or, or our facilities manager? It, it, the facilities manager acquired the study, uh, and it was done by an independent, it was done by, I believe, Harriman Associates out of uh, Auburn. Okay. And the other thing I was wondering about is, 
<clears throat> at that meeting, one of the school board uh, members pointed out to a $500,000 fund that they had available and thought that they ought to use that to go ahead and purchase the boilers. This school board member felt that was that ought to be considered because <clears throat> if the boilers were to one of them were to fail and there are two I understand if one of them were to fail in the winter then you know it would be kind of a scramble but since they had the money why didn't they go ahead and purchase it there was a lot of discussion another school board school board member felt that this is a sort of item that should be bonded through the town and they shouldn't spend the money so I'm wondering you know why why they don't uh, purchase it outright or or lease purchase um, on their own yeah go yeah ahead. I, I, the school department is currently looking at their budget uh, they're, they're, they're about to present their budget for fiscal year 2012 uh, one of the things the interim superintendent is doing with the cooperation of the school board is looking at a two to three year plan for, for the school budget not looking at a, the, the year of a single budget. The reason being is you know, the, last year they got a lot of stimulus monies, and that's, that's why they had some extra monies, as, as you indicated. Uh, the hope is to apply most of those monies to this year's budget. Uh, they don't yet know their school subsidy, but because they got so much stimulus monies, the last projection that came out, this was before the governor's budget came out, was about a loss of $660,000 in revenue from last year to this year. Uh, I've always believed that that estimate is high. I don't think it'll be that much, but I also have seen the state valuation amounts for the, the succeeding year, the following year, where our, our uh, valuation was, in the last couple of years, we, we've done the best about anyone can do in the state for having valuation go down in, in terms of helping school funding. However, for the, the next year after this, we're gonna be, well, it's not really bad, we're still one of the worst in the state. We're on the opposite side. Our valuation is just going down very slightly, while most are going down four or five percent. Which means that you know this year we're facing the loss of the stimulus, and next year we're facing uh, reduced state reduced school subsidy because of reduced uh, because our valuation uh, not comparing favorably in terms of helping school funding. So you know for, for that reason, you know, I think the school board. Is, is, you know, that I agree with you that may, there was that thinking last year, but my understanding is most of the thinking on the school board now is to look at it over two to three years uh, and to, to try to reduce the, the amount that would otherwise come from property taxes. Uh, you know, and, and obviously they're looking at spending as well, but the, the 500000 that you referenced, uh, you know, they, they received stimulus monies and there was also money in a jobs bill. And uh, that mainly is looking towards supporting next year's budget. Uh, and there's been a couple of other things that have come up uh, this year. For example, the, the hot water heater just in the last day or two went at the middle school, and that's about a $30,000 unanticipated expenditure. So, uh, you know, I, I think that they are looking longer term at finances and, and uh, money than sometimes they have in the past. And, you know, we, we are fortunate that. Uh, there was that jobs money that came and you know they didn't go off and spend it they they saved it uh, for next year's budget and, you know what we still you know the, the governor's report on you know his budget with school funding you know looked positive but it also depends on the legislature making an awful lot of other decisions as part of the budget process which may not be easy for them to make so we're still pretty early i think this this is a good plan because it uh it shows that the school department can get these new boilers without, without harming, you know, the taking away from funds that otherwise would be used to directly educate the kids. Uh, plus, it, it also has no negative impact on our uh, tax bills. Was there a percentage of that money, though, the stimulus money that they got? Was that, was, wasn't there a percentage required for capital improvements? So what was your question? Was the, of the a percentage, yeah. I thought there was a percentage of stimulus funds that were required for capital improvements. You know, I don't, if through you, yeah, uh, no, I, yeah, I, I don't know of any requirement in terms of stimulus that they didn't meet, you know, knowing how they were fitting it into the budget. I think they've met all the commitments and obligations on, 
on how the, the stimulus is to be used. Yeah. It is unusual for us to, well, it's not unusual in Cape Elizabeth. It is unusual for a community to make these sorts of funds available to a school department, but, you know, for a long time, you know, we have had the one town concept and believe in working with each other to meet needs and, you know, ultimately it's the taxpayers that would be funding this 350000 somehow. And, you know, and I also sense, as my memo, memo indicated, is, you know, I just, I think we, we ought to go a little slow in debt right now. Yeah, the interest rates are low, but if, you know, you, you look at the president's budget today and, uh, you know, it, it's a bit scary what the, uh, the long-term projections are for, for deficits and, uh, you know, I, I think Cape Elizabeth sets a good example by, uh, particularly until things settled out in Washington a little bit, of trying to uh, reduce our debt and not incur debt. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the other piece I wanted to say, Jessica, is uh, you know, the, the last time the council had a workshop that was with the school board, with the legislators, there was, there, there was some discussion on, you know, these different pools of money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they indicated that they're looking at it with their budget and, uh, you know, and I know, I know that they are, they're, they're looking at the alternatives and, you know, I really applaud the school board for looking at a two to three year plan uh, and not just, you know, spending money when suddenly it, it appears. I think that they've, they've done a good job this past year at, uh, at you know, looking toward the future and uh, preserving cash so that, uh, uh, you know, as they, they find a new equilibrium when all this settles out, uh, it, this, it helps them to have a soft, softer landing. Any other questions? <clears throat> Is there a motion? Sarah? Uh, I move we accept the recommendation <clears throat> that the $350,000 school boiler project be funded with 200000 from the municipal undesignated fund balance and that the balance of 150000 be funded through a five-year lease to be paid in the school budget over the next five years. The motion has been made. Is there a second? Uh, Frank? Okay, motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Uh, Mike? I just wanted to clarify, and that the balance be funded over five years as determined by the school board Sorry. is, yeah. It might not be exactly 150. It could be a little bit more, a little bit less. But it also defers to them exactly how they, how they do that. Could be, could be lower, though. Basically. It could be lower. Could be lower. Could be lower. Okay. So I accept that. Amendment. So the amendment is that the balance, whatever that may be, would be funded by the school board. To lease. Uh, to be determined by the school board. Yeah, to be determined by the school board. And uh, Frank, is that? But, but, but no longer than five years. I think that's a real key is you, it's, you know, just doesn't, for that small amount of money, it doesn't make any sense to extend it beyond. So I think that's a reasonable condition the council could set. Frank, is that amendment yeah. acceptable to you? It's acceptable. Okay. Is everybody clear on the amendment? No, could you repeat that, please? Sure. <laughs> Let me repeat it. Well, why don't you read the whole motion? That way we can all... Okay, I move we accept the recommendation that the $350,000 school boiler project be funded with 200000 from the municipal undesignated fund balance, the account to which overlay lapses, and that the balance of 150 thereabouts, be funded through a lease to be no more than five years, uh, repaid in the school budget as determined by the school board. And we, can, you might, we can clean it up in the minutes. If, if, is that okay? Does so everyone understand the import? Yeah. I think we, I... we, the undesignated fund balance pays 200000 The school is responsible for the remainder to be paid in a lease to be repaid, and they don't take more than five years. I think that actually sums it up the best. That's yeah. Okay. And Frank, you... Sounds great. Okay. As a seconder. Yes. Okay. Any further discussion or questions? Yes, Jessica. I just have another question. <clears throat> Who is ultimately responsible for the, the bill? Is it the town or the school department? The, through you, the, uh, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Taxpayers of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Okay. Yeah, the town of school, I, it, it's really material in the end. It's, it's the, it's the full faith and credit of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Okay. Any other questions? Frank. This is sort of a technical issue. Give me a little bit of historical background. Like I'd send you an email today on this question. It's the overlay is created by more taxable assets than we forecast. That's right. And the uh, calculation of the overlay is the total mill rate times that. 
right? And the 70 percent of that mill rate is schools, and approximately 30 percent is town. So one could conceptually think, well, 70 percent that surplus would automatically go to schools, and 30 percent would automatically go to town. That's not the way it works. What's, why does it? What is it within municipal accounting that requires that it all be allocated to the town? Uh, good question. Uh, it's asked from time to time in different communities. Uh, the towns always maintain the overlay because the towns are responsible for, for, for perfecting the tax collection. Uh, the schools get their monies once they're approved, no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the budget's passed. It's it's a it's a warrant. They get their money regardless. Okay. Uh, the town bears the full risk and responsibility of payments not being made, of valuation changes, of uh, you know, if someone going into default, mm -hmm. the property you know significantly decreasing in value. So the the practice has always been in the state of Maine that the overlay is not shared. Okay, thank you. And you know, and, and councils that look at things as a whole. It, it becomes less of, of an issue. Yeah. Yeah. I just have a comment, which I think this, um, I think this is a, a really excellent example of the one town concept, which makes our town much more efficient than many other communities where the towns, the, the municipal side of the budget and the school side of the budget are, are handled as separate silos. And uh, I commend both the, the superintendent and school board and the town manager for figuring this out because it's in the best interest of the people in the end, I think, for us to operate this way. And I would echo those comments, having had an opportunity to meet briefly with the superintendent. He was very complimentary of the town manager and this one town concept approach. So I mm -hmm. also uh, echo what Ann said on that, on that front. I think at this point we've had enough discussion unless there's anything else. All those in favor of the motion. <coughs> the motion carries unanimously. Uh, thank you, Mike, for that background. Um, item 54-2011, alewife regulations. Each year the town renews its right to govern alewife harvesting. I'm afraid this is a topic I know very little about. Um, does anybody have any questions? for the town manager would like some background on this? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Has anybody <laughs> seen any alewives? I mean, are they uh, actually coming back? I think we may, have, we may have somebody right here who can answer that question. Just not yes. many. But there are some out there. are some? Okay. okay. Just wondered. I Because we've, we've had this plan for, I don't know, how many years, Mike? Five years? Oh, six years, probably seven years? eight or nine. Eight or nine years? And I've just never heard of any alewives. But I'm glad we have someone who's in the yeah. know. You go at the right day, you can see one. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah, that's question. my question. Two. <laughs> people, people fish for these? They have, they have the potential to fish for them. <laughs> uh, and all, if there were more this, than one. All this action does is maintains us the right. The, the agenda was carefully worded. It governs our right to do it. To my knowledge, your father's never actually uh, harvested any, no? No, not that I've ever known. It used to be a big industry. It used to be a lot going through there, but that's a whole other issue for another day why there's none going okay. through there. But all we're doing tonight is preserving our right to govern. That's right. So, so moved. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Thank you. Uh, item 55-2011, uh, we have a recommendation before us to uh, authorize the town manager to sign a memorandum of understanding with FEMA regarding the risk map process. Mike, could you give us a little background on this? Yes, this has to do with uh, an issue that's been covered quite a bit in the newspapers of the, the new flood maps that FEMA put out and that FEMA then withdrew. They, they did that in favor of looking at moving the, the communities in the region to something called the risk map process. Uh, Bruce Smith's worked on this a little bit, but most of our heavy lifting has been done by, by Robert Gerber of, uh, used to be Sebago Technics, but now of Ransom Engineers. He just changed firms. Uh, and he drafted this memorandum of understanding uh, and drafted it specifically for 
to conform with his earlier knowledge of what the issues were with the flood maps for the town of Cape Elizabeth. What it does, potentially, it brings to us some, some uh, better maps and resources uh, from FEMA, uh, and with you know, very little obligation on the part of the town, uh, other than what we had anyway beforehand. There's, there's no real additional burdens here. The, the importance, as you know, I think it's been stated a couple of times, uh, is that we want accurate maps and we want to make sure that the folks that live in uh, these risk areas know uh, the uh, know the potential risks that are in those areas and that, that has to do with having accurate maps and appreciate the cooperation of the, the Boston office of FEMA and particularly uh, Senator Collins on this. Uh, she's worked very closely uh, working with Craig Fugate, who is a U.S. Administrator of FEMA, uh, in bringing us to this point. And then, uh, again, Bob Gerber coming up with all of this language. Thank you, Mike. Are there any questions? Anne? Yes. I, I read through this memo and found it quite technical. It is. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that it is your recommendation that we authorize you to sign this. It is. I, 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 uh, I find it very technical as well. I uh, <laughs> can't say that I understand all of it, but uh, I really have a lot of faith in, in Bob Gerber as being very knowledgeable and working as, and particularly working well with citizens. And he's also gained, I think, a certain measure of respect from the folks <coughs> with FEMA in Washington, which will, will serve us well. Uh, okay. It's been an uh, interesting process to this state. And, uh, you know, I, I really think that the mapping, you know, will, will help us in lots of different ways. Thank you. Jim? Question, Michael. Are there towns along the coast are signing similar documents? They're all being asked to, and I don't know to what degree that they've actually got to this point. I, when I got the, the invitation from FEMA to do what they were calling a charter, I immediately contacted Bob and said, would you draft something for us. We talked about it. We said we wanted to take a form of a memor mm -hmm. memorandum, an MOU, a memorandum of understanding instead of a charter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he's had some discussions with FEMA on this, but it still could, you know, be altered slightly. Uh, but, uh, you know, I expect that most of the communities will be doing this quickly, fairly soon. I went to a meeting with Bruce, oh, about two weeks ago in Saco, and uh, they had three different meetings. That one had probably 60 people there who were looking at moving forward on this process. So. But you were more proactive from the beginning. We have been more this, proactive. With this entire process. We've, I've had in my real estate dealings some, some issues with, with, um, with properties that weren't closed because there were so many unanswered questions and the insurance industry saying one thing and having maps say something different and not being able to get flood insurance and all these other issues. But in my discussions with, with Bruce and with Mike, we were much more out front with our engineer to make sure that, that this town anyway was ahead of the curve. Yeah. And I'm glad to see this come forward, frankly, because I think there's yeah. a lot of homeowners who yeah. will benefit from knowing. The city of Portland was most out front, and then right. we you know, give them credit, and then we followed them. Yeah. Good. Jessica. I, I read through it and it's very technical but I I also think well first of all who wrote who uh, did you craft our um, um, concerns and um, issues with mr. Gerber or yeah I mr. Gerber has Bob Gerber works for us so he's doing most of our, our drafting and he he is the one that interacts on a technical basis with FEMA on our behalf okay because I, I I thought whoever did this did a very nice job of, of looking comprehensively at what, what would be affected in town. And specifically, I thought it was interesting, the Pond Cove wave studies. <laughs> and I thought this was a very nice job of looking out for the town. And um, I just had another question. Has there been any increase in flooding? I mean, this is all to project to this, and I'm not really sure what's behind this with FEMA, why all of a sudden this is going on. I mean, that's another discussion, too. But has there been any increase in the town, as far as you know, in, say, the last 10 or 20 years? Uh, I can't say that I'm aware of any. What, what we're getting, like everyone else, is, 
is when we get storms, they seem to be a lot worse, you know, particularly rainstorms uh, we, and flooding in streams and brooks. And, you know, if, if, you, if you look at the last 20 years compared to the 20 years before that, there's no comparison. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to avoid the debate for this evening <laughs> of the, the larger global issues, but uh, it, you know, we, we've clearly had a, a lot of bad storms. We, we don't get, you know, one-inch rainstorms anymore. We get three or four-inch rainstorms. Uh, but, you know, the, the last time we've had major, major surf damage, uh, there were a couple of storms in 1978. And, you know, since then we've had some, some uh, you know, big waves or whatever, but actually doing damage to properties, uh, the last major storms were in 1978, and then a little bit for the, the, the perfect storm that was portrayed in the movie that President Bush's right. place down Kennebunkport got hit. But we got hit much harder in the, the 78 storm where they, there's a picture down Portland Headlight where they took out the whistle house. And right. There was some damage yeah. there. Yeah, and I, I remember that, and I also remember Shore Road at Pond Cove being completely washed out and underwater, but years ago, yeah. not recently. So. We've had it a couple of times not passable in the last couple of years when mm -hmm. we get, you know, upland coming, coming across. It's more from that than from heavy rains than it has been from tide. And then when the tide comes up too, yeah. it, it, you know, it, the forces meet and <laughs> you, you have big puddles. Right. Uh, do we have a motion? Ann. I move that we authorize the town manager to um, sign a memorandum of understanding with FEMA regarding the risk map process. Seconded. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, before we get to the final item on our agenda this evening, uh, we offer an, another opportunity for citizens uh, to discuss items not on the agenda, but seeing that no one is here. Uh, yes. Two Go. real quick things. Should yes. have mentioned beginning of the meeting. I, I attended the funeral this past month of Juliet Henchy, and Juliet was the widow of John Henchy, who was my predecessor as town manager. And she was just a wonderful woman and very supportive of John and his work here as town manager. And uh, just wanted to remember Juliet and. Uh, you know, as you all know, being here on Valentine's Day night, uh, it's, it's often the spouse at home that, that suffers as a result of you folks being here. And I think it's an appropriate night to remember Juliet. Secondly, uh, in the paper this morning, there was a mention that Admiral Rybecki had died. And it, it didn't mention anything to do with Cape Elizabeth, but it, uh, Rich, uh, Admiral Rybecki, he was the person who he negotiated with the original lease, Pert lease at that time, a Portland headlight to come to the town of Cape Elizabeth. He was the, the company, he was the commander of the U.S. First Coast Guard District in Boston. And just could not have been a more pleasure to work with, and uh, he, he was uh, with, the, with the First Coast Guard District. At that time, we had three or four meetings with him, and then he uh, later relocated, lived in Falmouth for a bit. And while there, for those of you who remember the op sale in 2000, he was the primary mover, the head of that committee in, in bringing op sale here to that huge event to Greater Portland. So just a, a great person, and uh, he died in Newburyport apparently in the last week, and just a, a great person. So wanted to remember them both. So. Thank you, Mike. Um, so with no citizens here to offer uh, any comments, uh, we have a recommendation to go into executive session uh, in conformance with 1 MRSA section 405-6A. Uh, to continue our annual evaluation of the town manager. So do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Jim. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor of the motion? Thank you. The motion carries. Uh, just before we adjourn, oh, I'm sorry. I should have probably mentioned the upcoming meetings. Uh, town council meeting, uh, our next uh, workshop is the February 17th meeting uh, to discuss electricity that was already mentioned. And then, uh, uh, town Council meeting March 14th and Finance Committee meetings March 16th and 21 and 20 March 21st. So, thank you. All set. Great. I know a couple of folks are coming on.